Okay. Welcome everyone to the fourth annual Maryland Legislative Coalition Summit. Uh, it's hard to believe we've been doing this for over three years now, but I'm happy we're still here doing it. Uh, I'll let you know this is being recorded. Uh, the Maryland Legislative Coalition is a coalition of grassroots, over 30 grassroots groups across Maryland. Uh, we've been advocating and pushing, encouraging people to support progressive legislation throughout the Maryland Legis Legislative General Assembly. Missing over there. Anyway, um, and with Cecilia Plant, the, our other co-leader, we have she has created a climate justice wing of the group, and this that is a coalition of both uh, NGOs and grassroots groups. They are supporting this year. They've picked two bills they are going to focus on. One is the Transit Safety Investment Act, and the other one is the Climate Solutions Act. Uh, and we hope you all will support those. We are also, if you're wondering why we don't have a an environmental segment for this su summit, that is going to take place in January 9th and 10th, and it's going to be the Eastern Shore uh, Legislative Summit, Environmental Legislative Summit. The, um, we, the first day will be devoted to uh, legislators, the next day will be devoted to NGOs speaking. And so we've incorporated the environmental section of the summit in, the, in with that. Um, now, if you are, we in some some things that you need to know. Um, we are posting in link uh, links to the PD the documents that have been supplied by the people that are speaking in this session. You can download those documents. We are including links to the Maryland uh, Facebook page and the Maryland web page. And then we also include a link to the be able to sign up for the Eastern Shore uh, Summit. Uh, now, when we after about an hour of speaking, we will have a half hour of questions. And we have a, a question moderator who will moderate all the questions that you have in chat. If you put it have a question, please put and ask and the name of the person you want the, the moderator to ask the question of. And then she will, after, after the end of the speaking, she will come in and ask the questions. Uh, we've now figured out spotlights so we can have all, all the speakers spotlighted at the same time for the questions. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I should tell you about? I think that covers it. So we shall start with our first speaker this afternoon, Allie Carter of Strong Schools, Maryland. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, I will share my screen. All right. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I am thrilled to be representing Strong Schools Maryland, and I see quite a few familiar faces here from our work with Strong Schools, so it's great to see you all. Um, in this time, I'm going to go over just a brief introduction because I know I haven't met many of you. Uh, we'll review our successes from 2020, a very quick blueprint outline for anyone who is unfamiliar, uh, our goals for 2021, and of course, sending you all with some action items. So I am the newest member of the Strong Schools team, so I wanted to just give you all a sense of who I am. Um, I was a vocal music and theater teacher. Uh, in Baltimore County for seven years. And I am very excited to continue organizing around education and equity um, as I'm so deeply passionate about it. So the biggest thing from 2020 is that we did what we set out to do. Our intention was to pass the blueprint for Maryland's future in the legislature and we did. As you can see the final votes on the right hand side, it, there was bipartisan support and overwhelming support of a new, more equitable school funding formula for the students of Maryland. Um, in Strong Schools specifically, uh, we sent over 34,000 emails to lawmakers, made over 5,000 calls to lawmakers. Uh, we had individuals regularly in Annapolis uh, meeting with our legislators and talking about the significance of the blueprint. Um, and we had a phenomenal rally with our coalition with over 500 people in attendance. 
And as you can see, we also made the front page of the sun. So here is where we are right now. It passed in the legislature. It then went to the governor and was vetoed. So now we are in the override stage. Uh, we are in a position where this language is being brought back to the legislature. And at some point this session, timeline still to be determined, uh, it will be voted on whether or not to override the veto and make this blueprint a reality. So let me give you a little background on the blueprint and understand that during the question and answer portion, I am more than happy to elaborate in greater detail on any one of these areas. So if any of these spark your curiosity, feel free to um, send some questions my way. So these are the key focus areas of the blueprint. The first is early childhood education. That will expand our birth to five early childhood education programs and promote equity. So there's not as much of a financial barrier to um, these early interventions and opportunities to have a head start on their education. The second is high quality and diverse teachers and leaders. Our intention is to recruit and retain high quality and diverse teachers so that they come to and are thrilled to stay in Maryland classrooms. Uh, the third is college and career readiness. That includes an expansion and growth of the career and technical education programs, our vocational programs, so that students have an opportunity to, as they graduate high school, be ready to go into the workforce in a high paying career that is really beneficial to their community. Additionally, um, it puts in additional checks throughout their high school and middle school times to make sure that they are prepared for college or whatever career they choose. Um, and it also addresses some dual en enrollment programs and make sure that that is also equitable and that there aren't financial barriers there. The fourth is more resources for the success of all students. This is addressing our at-promise students. So this is providing additional resources for special education, for English language learners, um, all of our students, uh, more additional mental health services uh, so that students are receiving wraparound services in a community school style setting. And finally is governance and accountability. This is checks and balances to make sure that this funding is being implemented equitably with fidelity, with consistency, um, and that it's regularly checked on to make sure that it's keeping up with the change in our times. Because let's be honest, the Thornton Commission met before the iPhone was invented. It is long overdue that we look at this funding formula and we wanna make sure that there are systems in place that we can keep an eye on it and make sure it's working as it should. So I know this is kind of the elephant in the room here. Can we really do this with the economic projections? The answer is yes. And frankly, we can't afford not to. Our, the children of Maryland have waited long enough. Um, in the language of the blueprint, uh, there is the King Amendment. It was introduced by Nancy King. Um, and it's essentially a safeguard for economic downturns. So if the Board of Revenue Estimates projects a state revenue decreased by 7.5% or more, um, then additional funding in the blueprint is paused, but current funding will stay on par with inflation. So this is part of the language that's coming back to the legislature. And it's to make sure that we are being mindful of economic downturns and being responsible with that while still providing what is absolutely necessary for our students. Um, and further, implementing the blueprint is an investment in the economy of Maryland over the lifetime of the students that it will impact. The SAGE policy report on the return investment study showed all of these amazing outcomes. Um, there will be more spending power, less reliance on social programs, reduced crime, uh, more businesses are attracted to the state, boosting state revenue. Families can return to the workforce sooner if they choose with the expansion of pre-K. Opportunities for Maryland businesses to expand with the growth of our career and technical education programs. And in fact, the projected net gain of state and local tax revenue is six point, or sorry, 3.6 billion over a lifetime per cohort of graduates. And the fiscal benefits, the return on our investment will exceed the cost as soon as 2034. It's a remarkable opportunity for the economy of Maryland and truly a, a wise investment in the future of our state. So I will post these in the chat in a moment, but there are two links that I will post. One um, has options and directions in both English and Spanish uh, to record a 60 second testimonial. It's just 
a, a video of you talking about why the blueprint funding is important to you. Our intention is to take the voices of Maryland citizens and elevate them to the highest levels of the legislature so that your voices are heard. And so the legislature knows that this is a priority of uh, Maryland citizens. The second is to email lawmakers about a topic addressed by the blueprint. Um, that's the second link I'll post in the chat. We have six topic focused emails that we encourage you to choose something that you're really passionate about um, and that you can infuse with your personal story um, and add to that email. It can be as quick as a one click send if you love the language as it is, but we encourage you to personalize it and send it off to your legislators. Um, and finally, share on social media. We all know that social media is extremely powerful, especially right now that everything is virtual. So talk about the blueprint, share things from the Strong School sites, um, encourage your personal network to share their stories and to email their lawmakers as well. And with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Ali. Next up, we have Pokua Oswalu of the Maryland State Education Association. There it is. Hello, everyone. How are you? Good. Um, as was just mentioned by Ed, my name is Pakua Wusu. I'm the newest member of the Maryland State Education Association, coming on as the managing director of legislative and political affairs. I'm really honored to be here with you all and uh, share on our Maryland State Education Association priorities for this upcoming session. Uh, my colleague, Ali from Strong Schools, uh, Strong Schools Maryland, pardon me, um, really just laid the emphasis of the same argument that we're gonna make here. The blueprint is our number one priority coming into this session and overriding the veto made by the governor. Um, by overriding, I mean, quite honestly, the blueprint, it, the stance for the blueprint is even more needed now after we see the effects of uh, the coronavirus and how it furthered the uh, gap between students who really need access to resources and quality education. Um, but with the override of the veto, it would also trigger the implementation of the Build to Learn Act, which would provide uh, $2.2 billion in new construction from school renovations statewide. Um, as we see from, again, with COVID-19, um, some of our schools are not equipped with the adequate resources and infrastructure for new, new students and uh, modern classrooms. So we're excited for that. And also a technical companion legislation that would go in essentially to um, kind of fix and recalibrate some of the dates and times and uh, guidelines that we have in the original blueprint to just adjust with inflation and some new um, restrictions based on what's happened with COVID-19. During this year, we also plan to do some budget advocacy regarding the 2022 budget. Um, as I'm sure some of you have heard, addressing enrollment is gonna be a really big concern for this session uh, with the enrollment numbers being based on this year. Um, and we have declining enrollment in some of our public schools. So that is a major issue for us. And we wanna make sure that we can maintain um, the blueprint programs because we know that once things start to get back to normal, those enrollment numbers are gonna go up and we wanna make sure that we can protect those in our budget. Some of our other priorities include overriding some of the vetoes that were also done by the governor, specifically regarding revenue bill overrides. Um, so the tax bill, um, pardon me, the tobacco sales to news tax and the digital advertising gross revenues tax, which is HB 732 of last year and uh, HB 932 respectively. Um, the digital ad tax would tax major uh, corporations like Facebook and Google for ad tax. Um, that money can go to the blueprint for Maryland schools as well as the tobacco, flavor, pardon me, the flavored tobacco tax that would also go to the blueprint fund. Uh, we also look to support legislation regarding HBCUs. Uh, the bill from last year would hopefully be overridden, but there were technical dates in there that complied with the current lawsuit. So we're looking forward to a new bill coming out and being in support of that because again, we wanna make sure that equity is accessible to our four HBCUs here in the state. Um, they provide world-class education to our students, as well as providing um, a source of educators, diverse educators um, that we need here in the state. So uh, we also hope to work with our coalition partners in re addressing racial and social justice legislation, um, clearly inside the classroom as we address with some issues in the blueprint, but also making sure that um, it's there's an emphasis put on 
really creating an equitable society means going outside the classroom. Uh, if our students don't have access to um, clean, affordable housing, health, economic systems that benefit them and their families, they can't succeed inside our classroom. So we're wanting to make sure that we partner with our coalition partners in addressing some of those concerns this session. Some of our other uh, critical issues include uh, fighting for progressive tax policy that closes, closes loopholes here in the state to make sure that those that make the most are also adding their fair share of tax into funding our schools and education for all our students here in Maryland. We're also, uh, the living wage is an issue that is becoming of a bigger concern and more obvious to all those that have lived through COVID-19. Our essential workers and our education support professionals were often the ones on the front line during this pandemic, working hard every day for all of us to make sure that we had what we needed. So we wanna make sure that we're supporting all those who are fighting for a fair livable wage for all Marylanders. Uh, the BOOST program, we were looking to have that program ended and rejecting voucher programs. There's clearly a gap in funding for our public schools. So we wanna make sure that those students are getting the funding that they need and that our money can be ad adequately allocated to the schools with the most need. Um, we're also working with our coalition partners to expand collective bargaining specifically to our community colleges. But again, as a union with anyone who's looking to expand as well. And again, really working with our coalitions to promote equity and fairness throughout the state. There's my contact information. We've also got Tina Dub on our team and Samantha Zwirling. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, in the packet that was provided by the Maryland Legislative Coalition, you'll see a two-pager based on our priorities for this upcoming session. So thank you and I'm, I'm glad to answer any questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy, do you have anybody that you want to introduce? Sure, I saw uh, Michelle Guyton. These are the delegates, uh, Al Carr, uh, Jen Terraza, Jessica Feldman, Mark, uh, Sheila Ruth, and Montgomery County Board of Education Chairman, Chairwoman, uh, Brenda Wolf. Great. I missed anybody. And I also Aaron Mansour from Senator Lamb's office has joined us again today. Okay. Great, thank you, Jimmy. Next up, we have Vinnie DeMarco of the Maryland Citizens Health Initiative. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not gonna have a PowerPoint, so I'll just talk. Um, thank you, Ed and Cecilia again, and Jess and everybody at Maryland Legislative Coalition for all your great work. I remember meeting with Ed just a few years ago when he talked about this idea and uh, sounded far-fetched. And I said, this is great, but it's gonna take a lot of work. And boy, you guys did it. I just wanna commend you for putting this together and continuing it in pandemic times. So uh, in talking about healthcare, I want to start with the great successes, which um, many of your organizations on this call endorsed um, and the Maryland Legislative Coalition in 2019, because those two successes lay the groundwork for what we're going to be doing in 2021. Uh, as everyone here knows, the Affordable Care Act has been a tremendous success in Maryland, expanding health care to 400,000 uh, Marylanders, 20 million Americans, and with uh, you know the Biden-Harris administration, the ACA is here to stay, so we can continue to protect and build on the ACA in uh, in Maryland. Uh, so, with the help of Maryland Legislative Coalition, Maryland in 2019 became the first state in the country to enact an easy enrollment program, which allows people, which at tax time, every everybody's asked, "Are you uninsured?" If the answer is yes, they're asked, "Can we get you insured?" through the exchange. And if the answer is yes, then it happens. And 50,000 Marylanders checked that box and thousands of people got enrolled through the easy enrollment. And many, many other states are looking to replicate that. And I think Senator Chris Van Hollen is gonna put in a national easy enrollment bill. So that was a huge success. And uh, a lot harder to enact, that was enacted bipartisan. The governor signed it, virtually everybody voted for it. The much harder to enact was the first in the country prescription drug affordability board. Uh, and that got enacted over the objections of uh, Big Pharma, which has been able to block that virtually every other state. And I remember at the very end, looked like a, a, a good bill was not gonna pass and Maryland Legislative Coalition and everybody else chimed in and they passed a very, very good bill. It is not everything we wanted, but it gets us going. It creates the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. 
It gives them the authority to find out wh how high cost drugs are hurting people, come up with a plan on how to make prescription drugs more affordable for state and local governments, which they will do, and come back to the legislature uh, in a couple of years with how to make prescription drugs more affordable for everybody. And a dozen other states are looking to replicate that success. So we can be very proud here in Maryland. And the board is in place chaired by a wonderful, wonderful guy, Van Mitchell, former health secretary. They got five great members on that board and they're working. And you can find out all about it at pdab.maryland.gov. And I'll try to put it into the chat, pdab.maryland.gov. You could uh, check it out and go to the meetings and find out what they're doing. Um, so that leaves us to what's happening um, uh, in, in 2021. One thing that uh, a legislation in uh, 2019 did not have was a permanent funding mechanism. And the board was instructed to come up with its own funding mechanism that would allow it to go forward uh, in a smart way into the future. And the legislature enacted that in 2020, a bipartisan overwhelming margin, majority support in the General Assembly and the governor vetoed it, a bizarre veto. Uh, nobody opposed that bill um, and uh, not even Big Pharma, but yet he vetoed it. Uh, we believe that's going to be overridden, that veto. So we uh, that's uh, one of our number one priorities in a 2021 session is to override the governor's veto of the prescription drug affordability uh, funding bill. Um, and um, like with um, like with the blueprint and congratulations, uh, strong, uh, uh, strong Schools Maryland, MSCA for all the great work on that, uh, that veto is going to happen sometime, we think, in mid-February. Because of COVID, it's not going to happen at the beginning of January, as most vetoes have in the past, overrides have in the past. So we are very hopeful the legislature will override this veto. The board would then have the authority to put an assessment on drug manufacturers, uh, 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 wholesalers, uh, PBM, pharmaceutical benefit managers, and insurers, and use that money to fund its work and pay back the state for a loan that it's using to do its work now. So that's uh, number one priority is to override that veto. Secondly, um, we want to continue to build on the success of the Affordable Care Act. Easy enrollment is a huge success. As I said, other states are trying to replicate it. But what we realized during the um, coronavirus uh, disaster, and as everybody, as so many people are trying to get, um, uh, trying to get uh, uh, unemployment insurance, that another great time to connect people to the health exchange is when they apply for unemployment insurance. Many people who, when they apply for unemployment insurance also lose their health care and they are too swamped to know what to do. And so uh, we, we sent a letter to the governor in April just suggesting that the Department of Labor without legislation set up a way to do that, to connect people when they file for an insurance with the exchange. They have not done it. Uh, and I believe that uh, Delegate Lord uh, Tricudian is going to put in a bill uh, to, to do that, to require them to do that. We want that to happen. We want to make sure that when people file for unemployment, they know that what, what their um, options are to get uh, free or low cost health care. In addition, there are people who uh, still can't afford health care coverage, with, even with the subsidies that the Affordable Care Act gives. Now, the Biden administration wants to increase those subsidies, which is great. But until that happens, and um, and possibly even then, there are going to be people who will need additional subsidies from the state. The Affordable Care Act has brought the uninsured rate in Maryland down to 6% from a high of 13%, which is great. Massachusetts, though, has an uninsured rate of below two per, uh, below 3%, close to 2%. And one of the main reasons is they have individual subsidies that the state provides to help people uh, get the health care uh, they need with, uh, and on top of uh, what the federal subsidies are. Um, and we, there was a bill put in last year by Delegate Jocelyn Penyamelnik and uh, Senator Brian Feldman to create an individual subsidies program here in Maryland, funded by an assessment which was already there on insurers. That did not pass. Uh, it was a study was created uh, required by the health exchange. The health exchange has completed that study and strongly recommends this subsidy. So we we really uh, uh, want, want to make that a priority to adapt the Massachusetts style uh, state subsidy program to make sure thousands and thousands of additional Marylanders who can't afford health care now can get it. And of course, that helps all of us when more people are insured. Uh, there's um, 
uh, less pressure on our premiums from uncompensated hospital care. So that's a uh, priority number two, building on the Affordable Care Act. Third is health equity. Uh, even with the success of um, even with the success of uh, the Affordable Care Act, there are still many people, particularly lower income people, uh, people of color, who, who can't get the health care they need. There are tremendously uh, unacceptable health disparities in our, in our state. Uh, in June of this year, Delegate Eric Barron and Jazz Lewis and Senator Antonio Hayes approached us to help them resuscitate a program which was created under the O'Malley Brown administration called the... Um, uh, called the Health Enterprise Zone. Some of you may remember those. They uh, were a program that was set up for a five-year pilot where five communities were picked, where money was injected and plans were put together to reduce health disparities. And it worked really, really well. For example, in Annapolis, they, they put a, um, a, a health center in a public housing complex and it really worked to reduce health disparities and reduce hospital costs for people. Uh, there's a web link, which maybe someone could put up for me, healthcareforall.com slash equity resolution, healthcareforall.com slash equity resolution, where you can find out all about this proposal. Well, we were thrilled to work with the delegates and senators to do this. It's now going to be one of our number one priorities uh, for the uh, 2021 session. We're thrilled that uh, the Maryland Legislative Coalition and many groups on this call have endorsed it. Basically, it creates uh, new entities we're calling health equity resource communities, and they will be able to re put resources into communities that come up with a smart plan to reduce health disparities. We wanna make it permanent though, and no longer just a, a pilot. The pilot was not renewed because Anthony Brown thought he was gonna become governor and renew it. Of course, that didn't happen, and Larry Hogan did not wanna continue a Brown initiative. So very sadly, those communities did not continue. Thank you for that chat. Um, uh, link in the chat. So uh, we want to resuscitate it as health equity resource communities, make it permanent, but make it permanent with the funding from a one penny uh, per dollar increase in the state alcohol tax. And that money would provide the money uh, that would be necessary to make um, uh, the health equity resource communities uh, permanent. We understand that bars and restaurants are having a big trouble under COVID. Uh, so they would, the tax on them will be delayed for two years. But otherwise, uh, uh, liquor stores are not having problem with sales. It would not be really hurt by this proposal, but the people would be would be helped a lot because we know that the 2011 alcohol tax that the legislature passed resulted in a tremendous drop in underage drinking and drunk driving and provided money for smart healthcare programs. So this is a smart way going from nine cents to 10 cents to fund the uh, health equity resource communities into the future. It would be a really good way of making uh, health equity a priority in our state. And we hope that uh, everyone on this call uh, can endorse it. And I'll be happy to answer questions about any of our priorities. Again, hats off to the Maryland Legislative Coalition for all you've accomplished. Thank you, Benny. Thank you very much. All right, next up, we have Compassion and Choices with Donna Smith speaking. Okay, it would be nice if I got off mute. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having us speak today at the Maryland Legislative Coalition. We have enjoyed your partnership for the last couple of years and we need you to partner with us now as well. Last year, um, as all of you know, the legislative session closed early. And so our bill, um, the 2020 Maryland End of Life Option Act, um, also known as the Richard E. Israel and Roger Pitt Moyer Act, um, did not get out of the Senate committee. It wasn't even slated for a vote. The previous year, um, this bill made it all the way through the House. Um, it was voted out of the House and it went to the Senate and it went to the Senate floor and it died on the floor in a 23 to 23 vote. And then last year, COVID happened and we didn't get to a committee vote in the Senate. Because it's already made it through the House, our focus is now on the Senate because the House won't even introduce it until it gets through the Senate. So about the bill itself, the Maryland End of Life Option Act is the term for this is medical aid and dying. That's the concept. So medical aid and dying allows terminally ill adults to request and receive a prescription 
for medication that they may choose to take to bring about a peaceful death. To qualify, one must be mentally capable, able to self-ingest the medication and have a prognosis of six months or less to live. And like I said, Compassion and Choices is proud to have enjoyed your support over the last couple of years. Um, we had a lobby day um, and, and many of you were there and Ms. Plant spoke at the lobby day and we, we are really looking forward to getting this bill out of the legislature this year. Um, last year, there was a Gonzalez poll in January that says 66% of Marylanders are in favor of this act. So we are still building our coalition. We have a, uh, a list of coalition members and they're in the document that was shared. But um, if you are interested in supporting us once again, this is our ask. We will be having uh, a lobby week the week of January 25th through the 29th. Um, we will have some activities. And if you email us, and the email is in the document that I shared, it's Wendy Minor at Compassion and Choices. We will give you the details. Um, we will be hosting a virtual lobby day. And we will be holding what we're calling Compassion Sunday. Um, Compassion Sunday is broader than the bill. It's just a Sunday where we like, we would like people of faith and people of conscience just to acknowledge all of the loved ones that we have lost this year. This year has been a hard year. And so um, we have these activities that we will be hosting the 25th of January through the 29th. And I invite each of you to get involved and help us get this bill passed this year. I look forward to any questions that I can answer during the Q&A period. Thanks. No, oh, me. Tom. OK, there we go. Thank you, Donna. Next up is Maryland Family Network and Beth Morrow. Great. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. OK, hi, I'm Beth Morrow from Maryland Family Network. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, as many of you probably would agree with me, the United States really needs a national paid family and medical leave program, but we know we can't wait for Congress to act. Nine states and DC already have programs in place or in process of establishing programs like the one I'm about to talk to you about today. I'm here to present Maryland's Time to Care Act. It would establish a state family and medical leave insurance program where employees could take up to 12 weeks of paid leave from their jobs to care for new children or other family members with serious health conditions or disabilities or for themselves. Our um, legislative leaders um, include Senator Antonio Hayes, Senator Sarah Elfrith, Delegate Chris Valderrama and Delegate Ariana Kelly. This is a picture from a press conference that we held last year uh, on occasion of the bill being introduced. Uh, we have a coalition that's grown over the years, over 69 organizations strong. We've got labor, faith, seniors, um, poverty advocates, disabilities advocates. We all believe that people shouldn't have to choose between the job they need and the family they love. Oops. Uh, you might be asking yourself, don't we have this already? But no, actually, uh, we have the uh, Federal Family and Medical Leave Act that was passed back in 1993. Um, it's only for uh, employees um, who work at businesses of 50 or more employees and the leave is unpaid. So it's not really a benefit that's accessible to many. Um, and now during COVID, we can see that this is something that we need even more than we ever thought we did. Uh, we can plainly see that economic health and personal health are linked. There is a provision in the federal COVID um, uh, fa Families First Coronavirus Response Act that grants people temporary leave, but it expires at the end of this year 
and it leaves millions of workers out. So this is something that we really need the state to act on, not just because of COVID, but it just makes it even more evident why it's something that we need. Um, many times women are the caregivers, um, but this isn't just a women's issue. Um, I'll give an example from DC. They began providing paid family leave in July and WAMU recently told a story of a man named Andrew who took leave from work to care for his dying mother. He described being with her and coordinating her medical care, making sure her insurance claims were filed correctly. He said it was stressful. And if, the, if that he'd had lost his income at the same time, it would have been devastating. So this bill would set up a fund. It would create a system so that Marylanders could take the paid leave. It would provide job protection to the leave taker. The benefit would be portable, uh, not tied to just one employer. The leave could be taken inter intermittently. So for periodic chemotherapy treatments, for example, the wage replacement would be progressive. 90% um, of weekly wage for low wage workers and the wage replacement would be capped for higher wage workers at $1,000 per week. Employers and employees would pay into the fund. The total contribution wouldn't exceed 0.75% um, of an employee's wages and any income over about $137,000 wouldn't be counted. The self-employed could opt in. Um, for others, contributions would be mandatory. Momentum is building. Um, Colorado uh, just passed a ballot initiative um, and became the latest state to establish a program like this. And we'd like to make Maryland next. You can find out more about the initiative at timetocare.net. There, I welcome you to sign up for coalition updates. There is a feature where you can uh, share your own personal story. If that's something you um, see yourself in, uh, we invite you to share your story. If you like to use social media, uh, please use our hashtag, which is time to care MD. And there's also an opportunity for you to contact your legislators and tell them that this is something that affects your family or something that you believe Marylanders should have access to. I'll be here later to answer additional questions. Again, I'm Beth Morrow, uh, time to care.net for more information. And thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, Beth. Uh, next, we have Nara Pro Choice. They have sp three speakers that will be speaking. Uh, we have Diana Phillip, uh, Hazmat Sharani, <laughs> and Brittany Ellers. You got them? Hey, folks. I'm Diana Phillip with NARA Pro Choice Maryland. Um, we have bills that are the intersection of health and education because we believe that sexual and reproductive health care should be protected in advance and allowing our students to be able to realize their educational goals. And so we have three bills. And since we have um, a pretty robust internship program, right there we, have, above you. we have interns who take leads on teams in order to help get the legislation passed. And so they engage in policy research and they engage in the kinds of um, organizing and outreach in order to find folks who are on the ground, who are really affected by this legislation to come forward and tell their stories. And so I'm gonna have Hashma that's gonna be talking about our menstrual equity bill in public schools. And Brittany is gonna be talking about pregnant, expecting and parenting students and the resources they need in order to finish their school and take care of their families. Here you go. Hashmat, go first. Thank you for the introduction, Diana. Um, sorry, I'm trying to share my screen. All right. Um, so I'm presenting the Menstrual Equity Alliance for Maryland Students Bill, also known as the Memes Bill. Um, all right. So kind of touch base on what period poverty is. So period poverty is the inability to access menstrual, menstrual hygiene products. This and corresponding issue of menstrual stigma are barriers to education for many Maryland students. Um, in 2019, 43.2% of Maryland public school students were enrolled for free or reduced price meals, indicating that their families struggle to afford basic needs. Um, so I've created this pie chart to kind of put into perspective how large of a um, number 43.2% actually is. Um, black children are twice as likely than white children to live in poverty in Maryland, meaning period poverty disproportionately impacts girls and young women of color from low income families. Um, the average age of Menarche first period is 12 years old, but 30 to 50% of girls get their period before this age. Black and Hispanic girls generally reach Menarche 
before their white counterparts, which adds on to how disproportionately uh, girls of color face period poverty. So we're taking action by collecting testimonies to present to the General Assembly in January. Um, we're working with other menstrual advocacy groups and having a social media campaign. And we're also hosting a virtual info and letter writing party in early January. Um, yeah, so our goal is to require public school bathrooms to install low cost quality vending machines, dispensing free maxi pads and tampons to students. Our goal overall is to increase school attendance, increase extracurricular participation and decrease peer harassment regarding um, menstrual taboo and stigma. Special thank you to our sponsors, Delegate Kirill Resnick and Senator Sarah L. Ruff. Sorry, sorry. And, and, and just to be clear, so the bill calls for a five-year plan, a five-year rollout of all public schools, and there's a, a, a preliminary rollout by October, no, August of this next year to have at least one restroom in every elementary school building and then for the secondary schools for female identified and um, unisex identified bathrooms to have these dispensers, um, at least I, I think it's all of them. And then at least one may, well, all of them over a five year period, but at least I think two it is. And then for um, at least one male designated bathroom in every public school building. So it, the idea is we're giving folks five years, but at, in the front for this next year, if we pass this legislation, there'll at least be some that are uh, dispensing in buildings to increase access to the products. Thank you. Brittany. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Brittany Ehlers um, and I'm gonna be talking about the Smart Start policy for pregnant, expectant and parenting students. Um, so a little quick facts here related to the bill. Um, so in Maryland in 2018, we know that there were 2,645 births to teenagers under the age of 19. Um, and this bill is particularly going to help achieve educational outcomes and prevent uh, dropout and school pushout that occurs as a result of becoming um, pregnant or a parent during um, your high school and secondary education. So nationwide, um, only 50% 50, 50 of teen mothers get a high school diploma by the age of 22 as compared to 89% of women who did not have a child during their, high, their teen years. And one third of teenage mothers never end up getting a GED. Um, and then almost half of female dropouts and one third of male dropouts said that becoming a parent was a factor in their decision to leave school. So this bill is gonna to work to provide additional supports to this group of students so they can stay in school, graduate and achieve their personal and professional um, outcomes. So um, our Senate legislative sponsor, we have Senator Mary Washington with the Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. And then our House legislative sponsor is Delegate Michelle Guyton on the Ways and Means um, Committee. And then, so this bill is actually gonna be in two parts. Um, the first one is the policies and reports part of it. So the Maryland Department of Education is going to develop a model policy that will support the educational and parenting goals of pregnant and parenting students. So the policy is gonna require school, uh, public school districts within the states to do a few things. So the first is that each school will have to designate a private location that can be used as a lactation space. Um, so it must have access to a sink and a refrigerator, a seating option, a flat surface, and an electrical outlet in order to accommodate breast pumping and breastfeeding for students. Um, it cannot be a bathroom or a closet. It has to be a designated safe space where women can um, uh, provide uh, breastfeeding or can breastfeed or uh, pump. Um, additionally, each school will assist and advise pregnant and parenting students with finding safe, affordable, and reliable childcare or early childhood education services and transportation. So this is going to be done through the establishment of a liaison within each school so the students can have a um, member of the school administration supporting them and helping them find these resources available for them. Um, and then in 2017, uh, NARAL helped pass HB 616 that has a 
attendance policy uh, and excuse absence policy related to pregnant and parenting students, meaning that they must be given a, a minimum of 10 days of excuse absences for parenting related needs. And this would just ex be extended under this policy to include excuse absences for any time that they need to be breastfeeding. So that's the part one of this bill. Part two is the Maryland uh, incorporation into the Maryland longitudinal data system. So this data system already exists within the state of Maryland and it collects information on enrollment and degree seeking status for students, um, course and completion status of, um, among various other educational indicators. But what is not included in this longitudinal data system is pregnant and parenting student status. So this bill will add that as an indicator. So pregnant and parenting student status can be tracked and we can see the number of students that are achieving their educational outcomes and graduating within the state. So we'll be able to know how many um, have dropped out, how many of them were able to graduate and then some outcomes related to their um, immediate professional lives following graduation. So as I mentioned earlier, our overall goal is going to be to uh, De decrease school push out for pregnant and parenting students, as well as helping them achieve their educational goals. So that is that. Thank you. And uh, uh, one other thing about that bill is that we're not asking for additional staff. We're not asking for schools to build childcare centers or lactation spaces. We're talking about connecting with a, you know with existing staff and existing resources. But I also want you to know there's another bill that's coming that didn't get pre-filed, but and probably it's going to be more of an education for the committee's kind of bill, and hopefully we can work on in 2022, is the idea of uh, University of Maryland is willing to partner and do a, a pilot project with five school districts to, for three years, collect data on the challenges and barriers and outcomes of pregnant, expecting, and parenting students and to help inform what kind of policies the school districts really should engage in to make sure that these students are getting the educational um, services that they deserve and the equity that they deserve. They, they need to have the same access to a rigorous education as their non-parenting peers. And we're really concerned that even with uh, the blueprint for Maryland's future, that this was not a population that people specifically talked to and talked about. And our concern is that if, you know, if we can do this kind of research, which we think is a great investment, in the state of Maryland, we consider how many youth are parenting in our, our state to actually have this data to teach the school districts how to collect this data in these five pilot areas in our state. And it's the five school districts with the highest teen pregnancy rate. We think that's gonna be a, a great um, a product that we can use for recommendations for legislation in the future. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you, Diane. Next up is our question moderator, Jess. We will be sharing everybody, all the speaker screens and Jess as well. Hi everyone, uh, Jess Gorski. And I just have some questions that I've gleaned from the chat. If anybody else has a question, send it over, just mark it, ask, and we can make sure that we you know, ask the person that you'd like to yeah, direct it to. That being said, as Ed mentioned, we're going to save the chat. So there's been some important links and different websites and people to contact shared in there. We'll be sharing that at the um, at the conclusion of the summit, all the different um, chats. So we all have that. And then if you've been seeing that as well, there's been a PDF packet that's been being shared um, in the chat section as well. Everyone who presented today um, submitted a, a one page or informational um, paperwork about their priority legislation and you can go there and you can get that from this panel and as well as the other three panels that participated in the summit. So there's a lot of important information in that little uh, chat screen over there, but let's get started. And uh, one of the first questions we have for- um, We have Donna Smith. Excuse me? Hello? Hi, so one of the first questions that we have is um, Pokui, am I pronouncing your name correct? Pokui Owashu? It's Pokuio Owusu, um, but you can also Pukuyo. refer to me as PK. Okay, Pokui Owashu. Um, the question was, will you be advocating for royal, ro royal, for rural broadband access for all students? And 
Who are your particular partners in this upcoming legislation? Uh, yes, uh, that's a really good question. I, I Due to time, I totally left it out. But yes, we will be advocating for an expansion in broadband access, especially to our rural communities. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of partners uh, in terms of those that have similar alignment and wanting to expand uh, broadband access. I think maybe what we are pushing for may differ. I know that here at MSEA, we would like to see it be turned into a utility. Um, and I'm not sure everyone is on the same page with that. Uh, but uh, we're working to you know, see where we can align with other groups. I'm new to my job just a, a couple a couple weeks here. So um, I, I'm, I'm not going to disclose all the people that you know we are, but we are definitely right. working on that. And uh, as we get that information, I'll make sure to share. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for answering that. Our next question is for um, for both uh, Maryland Strong Schools, Allie and, and MSEA. Are either of your blueprints or are either of you for healthcare centers and schools uh, being paid for Medicaid, thinking along the lines of schools in poor neighbors, neighborhoods having a school pediatrician, dentist, psychological counseling, in addition to school nurse, a, a student with a toothache or an illness who cannot see, or the board clearly is not ready to learn, um, you know, provide therapy additional. So almost having an in-house clinic. Is that part of any of the blueprint paperwork? or any of the legislation that you guys are both supporting? I can start with, uh, I'll, I'll answer a couple of pieces of that. The first is okay. that the Blueprint does expand uh, mental health services offered through schools, that is through school psychologists, school counselors, and school, so school social workers. Um, and that will especially um, support our families who are experiencing poverty. Um, and these resources will also help families navigate um, personal health needs and find the resources in their community. That's the idea behind community schools is that there are connections to parents, connections to families, um, especially connections in languages that these families speak um, so that they understand the resources that are available to them and can navigate them in a way that um, is reasonable. Um, additionally, um, the discussion of uh, resources for, I, I believe the example is ADHD. Um, one of the uh, large expansions in the blueprint funding is for special education services. Uh, and one of the biggest benefits of that is the expansion of our early childhood education programs. Um, early interventions are huge, especially in special education. That means that it can be identified students that have specific learning needs early on so that they can um, get the resources and supports and programs that they need to be as successful as possible. So that uh, I'm I'm happy to discuss that uh, question more offline. I put my email in the chat, but I hope that that answers some of it at least. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, Ali really hit it on its head. I, I think, again, um, the focus on the community-based schools that provide those wraparound services so that, you know, students who do suffer from health ailments will be able to get the treatment that they need. I'll also put my contact information in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. There was some chatter um, going on about the aspect of it. One of the next questions we have here goes to Donna Smith. And this is, and Donna, I've worked with you before with this legislation and um, this common question, what can you say to address the concerns of the disability community when it comes to your uh, bill? Thank you, Jess. I failed to mention you've been a long time advocate with us. You've testified numerous times. So thank you so much. Um, I was able, well, I thought I was sharing the link to a disability rights Oregon letter that we got um, last year, uh, which says that they've received very few complaints and the complaints they received from um, the disability community is that they didn't feel like they had adequate access to the bill. So I wish we had more conversation with the disability rights community. Their fear is that the bill will be used against them. They already, like a lot of communities of color, have trust issues with medical providers. And they think that this bill will be used against them. In all honesty, this bill is totally voluntary. No one in this law is forced to do anything. 
if you're a patient, you're not forced to get this bill. You have to request that the doctor initiate the process. The process can take anywhere from four to six weeks. So you really have to want this bill. In order to even initiate the process, you have to be determined that you are terminally ill and have a prognosis of six months or less to live. And that has to be determined by your uh, primary physician as well as an attending physician. And then in Maryland, inherent in the law is that you must meet with your physician one-on-one -on -one without friends or family members present to make sure that no one is trying to unduly or unlawfully um, coerce you into making this decision. Um, also involved in the process is you have to have two people as witnesses certify that you're making this not under duress and one of those people cannot be anyone that would benefit from your death. And so there are safeguards in the law to ensure that those with disabilities, but anybody would be safe in making this decision. Um, when I say it's totally voluntary, doctors aren't even required to write the prescription, but they must refer you to someone who will. Pharmacists, if they feel like this is not something they can do, um, do not have to fill the prescription, but they must refer you to someone who will. And so no one in this law is forced to do anything. It is totally about a person having choice and control at the end of life. Great Thank question. you, Donna. Thank you for that. Um, next, Beth Morrow with Maryland Family Network. You answered this over in the chat, but I think this is an important question to be addressed for all the attendees. The question was, what about 1099 contractors on paid you know, Family Medical Leave Act? And that's definitely something you know, for anybody who's hired and, and a contractor position rather than as a direct hire. And you said that they would be covered, but could you kind of speak to that? Sure, an independent contractor could make the choice to opt into the state's family and medical leave insurance program if they chose to, um, but they wouldn't be required to contribute. Um, for other workers in Maryland, the contributions would be mandatory. Okay, thank you. So if they were to contribute to that, then they, then they would have that um, resource should they need it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. The next question is for Vinnie DeMarco. Um, one of the things you kind of referenced, um, you know, with your new legislation is the funding and your bill carries, um, you, you know, uh, you're going to be raising the tax on alcohol and right now with retail and hotels and liquor stores, I know that you will be directing towards liquor stores, but could you speak to how um, the fiscal aspect of your legislation um, won't be um, be deemed as a, a, a problematic during these post-COVID times. Well, thank you for the question. Before I answer, Jess, I wanna also thank you for all you did to enact the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, telling your own thank story you. and all your help. So thank you, Jess. Um, thank well, you. Uh, uh, in 2011, Maryland increased our alcohol sales tax from six cents per dollar to nine cents per dollar. And the reason they picked nine cents is that's what DC was at the time. DC has since increased theirs to 10 cents and using the money from the additional penny for healthcare. So I think it makes a lot of sense for us to do that. One of the most important things about the alcohol tax increase is that it reduces underage drinking, drunk driving and other alcohol abuse and really is a lifesaver in and of itself. We did hear right away when we talked about this that bars and restaurants are really having a tough time as everyone knows under COVID. So we have delayed the impact of the um, uh, uh, one cent increase to alcohol bought for use in bars and, and restaurants. So that's delayed for two years. Alcohol stores are doing very well uh, and they are not gonna be hurt by this one cent increase. What it will do is reduce underage drinking and drunk driving and bring in the money necessary to make the health equity resource communities work. It will bring in $14 million a year for the first two years. One million of it will go to drug and alcohol prevention programs across the state and the rest to the health equity resource communities. 
after it becomes fully effective with bars and restaurants in two years, it will bring in 22 million per year. Two million will go to drug and alcohol uh, prevention um, uh, and the rest to health equity resource communities. There has been no evidence of any kind that the increase from six cents to nine cents that happened in 2011 did any harm to any stores. What it did do is save lives and this additional tax will continue to save lives, not have any economic uh, bad impact and fund health equity resource communities. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for clarifying that because I know that that's a big question for anything that um, is targeting, well, anything that has a fiscal note or is targeting any part of the industries that have suffered during the pandemic. My, the next question is for um, Narrell and, wh and whoever um, wants to field them. The, what are your plans for maintaining menstrual equity after the five-year limit? Will you engage students to evaluate the progress? It's, it's a five-year rollout, so it's up to the school districts to determine Okay. How. Yeah, so it's, it's a long-term solution. But I think that's also very interesting about uh, um, surveying the students to find out if it's enough, because I am a little bit worried about people trying to reduce the number of restrooms they think that these products should be dispensed in. And that will be interesting. Wonderful. And then the other question to you all is, will the Memes Bill also place menstrual supplies in college higher ed bathrooms? You mentioned the study with University of Maryland, but are they going to be putting them in their own bathrooms? Okay, so the menstrual equity bill is about elementary and secondary schools. The University of Maryland study is about the pregnant and parenting students um, research that we want to get conducted to help the school district be more informed. I'm so sorry, Diana, for con to, to conflate the two. I apologize for that. So, with, so the the memes bill is strictly focused on secondary and um, primary and primary. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. The next thing we want to go through is we're just this goes to everyone and I will go through and just ask you individually by name um, to go through it. But one of the things we want to ask is with all of these activists who are on this panel today and the groups that the Maryland Legislative Coalition works with, what is which of your proposed legislation oh, yeah. so do you see happening? Hello? Sorry. Um, which of your proposed legislation do you see having the greatest obstacle this upcoming session? And what is the major roadblock that our membership could pro, you know, productively target? What are, what's an actual item? And I know that Ali, you know, had listed that some actual items and Donna had said, this is our ask. But if you were to ask these attendees right here, what can we turn around and do starting you know next week to support your legislation and what would have the greatest impact that'd be great for you to share that so we'll start with um with Allie carter from strong schools sure so all eyes are on overriding the blueprint in the strong schools maryland world um it has been such a long time coming it is so needed and uh like pk so beautifully said it all of the reasons that the blueprint was formed in the first place are really rising to the surface um, in this COVID era. So I'm going to put in the chat again, there are, there are two things that you can do, um, mainly just telling your story and talking to your lawmakers, um, reiterating that this is a priority of um, citizens of Maryland and that it's an absolute necessity. So the first is recording a video testimony. Um, again, there's uh, links in English and Spanish, and we strongly encourage people to record it in whatever language they feel most comfortable. We'll be, we'll, we'll bear the burden of translation. Um, the second being topic focused emails, which again, we encourage you to edit and add your personal story to. Um, and then my email is there as well. So if you uh, ever have any questions about the blueprint, um, or are wondering other ways to get involved, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Ali. And then um, uh, Pokuya, Pokuwa, did I PK is fine. Um, PK, I'm sorry. It's okay, it's I okay. I feel like Ali and I are like a duet in, or a singing group today. Like we're, we're on the same key here, but uh, the blueprint is our priority focus this year. Um, 
And the emphasis really needs to be to our legislators that have supported you know, the bill when it passed out of the legislature that we thank them for their support and that we're really looking forward to their assistance in overriding the veto. And that again, for their constituents and for students all over the state of Maryland, it's absolutely important that we override this veto. Um, again, the inequities that we've seen, some of us have known existed in our communities have just been more amplified and the blueprint will help to cure some of those. So we're really looking forward to that. Again, um, thanking those and providing support to our members that supported the bill and just letting them know that we're gonna be there behind them, advocating behind. So just, you know, sometimes a little, a few words of encouragement to our friends helps, you know, help them do the right thing. So again, that's what we're looking for. And really just the sooner we can get an override, the better. Um, I know that the longer we wait on it, there are other uh, things that get affected with that in, our, in terms of our budget. So we're really just looking forward to advocating for people supporting it and thanking, them, thanking those who do. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Vinny, um, if you could answer the same. Yes, thank you. Uh, we are pretty confident that the legislature will override the governor's veto on a prescription drug affordability board uh, funding bill. Uh, still, if you're talking to legislators, you should uh, uh, urge them to do that. And we also have very good feelings about the uh, ACA uh, protection and building on bills. Uh, the health equity resource communities legislation um, is not going to be easy because of the alcohol tax is going to be fiercely opposed by the alcohol industry. And the alcohol industry is powerful in Annapolis, and they blocked alcohol tax increases for 40 years before we were able to get the increase in, um, in 2011. Uh, Republicans and Governor Hogan will also oppose it because they oppose uh, any kind of tax. So, uh, but without it, the health equity resource communities won't be able to have the funding they need to really reduce health disparities. And we won't have the additional savings of of young lives from uh, problems caused by underage underage drinking. So the way, two ways you could help is go to our website, healthcareforall.com slash equity resolution, which is on the chat before. And if your group hasn't yet, join the over 200 faith, community, labor, business, and healthcare groups, which have uh, endorsed this proposal. We'd love every organization on here uh, to endorse it, just like the Maryland Legislative Committee has. And if uh, we are gonna be asking people to contact legislators, particularly Democrats, on the ways and means, and in particular, budget and tax committees. Uh, we have a lot of this. This bill will probably go to uh, budget and tax and finance in the Senate and ways and means and health and government operations in the House. We have strong support um, uh, on the two health committees, including the chairs, Chair, Chair Pendergrass and in the House and Chair Kelly in the Senate have all our co-sponsors. It's gonna be harder in the two tax committees, budget and tax and ways and means. So anybody who wants to help with this proposal, you can get all the information at healthcareforall.com slash equity resolution and contact uh, especially Democratic members of the ways and means and budget and tax committee and tell them you urge them to enact the health equity resource communities legislation with the one cent per dollar alcohol tax. And thank you for this great question, Jess. Certainly, and thank you to the three of you who have presented so far. Having a truly actionable item and being able to know that you can email or join a coalition, um, you know, put your name behind it and then, then share that with your network so that you can ask them to do the same. You know, um, sometimes you can feel lost when it comes to big pieces of important legislation on how you can be effective. But uh, what people need to realize is that your voice being shared is more powerful than you think. So uh, now with uh, Donna Smith um, with Compassion Choices. Donna, if you'll answer the same question. Yes, ma'am. So with our focus being in the Senate, um, we want people to reach out to their state senators. They really need to hear from you this year. Um, with so much going on and you know, this has become less of a priority. We got very close two years ago, but we certainly don't want to lose the momentum that we have gained um, in the last two years. So please, if this is something that you're supportive of, please call your state senator. Um, we need, we are three senators shy of passing this legislation in the Senate. We only need three more to come on board. And so with that, um, just ask you to join our coalition and 
get more involved and get your organizations involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. And uh, Beth, Beth Mara with Family, um, Maryland Family Network. Thank you, Jess. Sure. Uh, our website again is timetocare.net. There are many ways you can get involved. If you're a member of an organization, we invite you to sign on and join um, the list of supporters of the organization, I mean, of the coalition. Uh, if you're an individual, I welcome you to um, either share your story on social media using the hashtag timetocare.net or to contact your own legislator and let them know that this is important to you and this is something that you believe Marylanders should have. Um, we're we expect the bill to be in the House Economic Matters Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, we would particularly welcome you to contact your legislator if they sit on those committees, or if you have a legislator who sits on a different committee, and this is something that's important to you, ask them to tell their colleagues who are on those committees that they're hearing from their constituents that this is a priority. Um, we really want to um, build the case and, and um, grow the momentum uh, behind this bill. This is not the first go around for this bill and um, momentum is building and we want it, your we want your voice to be part of the chorus of people that are asking for this and I thank you to all the people who are on the call who are already members of the coalition or who have already testified in support of the bill again it's the time to care act and my emails in the chat if um, anybody has questions after today thank you very much I have one question for you Beth this is something that I um, was advocating for myself last year, but it is a common um, roadblock that many people encounter. Like, as you said, we have to talk to the Senate Finance Committee and House Economic. Both are, it's fiscal. There is, you know, the roadblock is, well, this is going to put a fiscal strain on small businesses, or this is going to, you know, you're asking too much of businesses to help contribute to this or anything else. And, you know, my argument and others is that you know, having a uh, reliable and loyal workforce uh, definitely fiscally pans out in the long run as opposed to the extra, you know, extra money towards Family Medical Leave Act. But how do you address that um, roadblock that, that seems to be one of the greatest ones that we run into when speaking with our elected officials? Thanks for the question, Jess. Yeah, the contribution that businesses would be asked to make is minimal, we think, for the benefit that that um, they would uh, receive in return. Um, the way the bill's drafted, the contributions would come 50% from employees and 50% from employers. And we're talking about splitting about $5 a week for the um, average worker's weekly wage. So it's, it's a small amount of money. Um, and for that, um, you know, um, when a worker is out, you don't have to pay them. The state fund pays them when they're taking the leave. That leaves the business owner with the opportunity to either uh, shift work around between the people who are still there or hire a temporary worker if they need to and pay them. Um, it puts small businesses on the more level playing field with the bigger businesses who might be able to afford a benefit like this. Um, usually small businesses value um, their employees and think of them as, you know, tight knit family. Um, it's something that small businesses often want to be able to provide, but sometimes think they can't administer. This would take the administrative burden off of them and put it um, on the state instead. So um, we are we do have business supporters. Um, we would welcome more of them. Um, and uh, we think that it's something that would actually be a benefit to businesses and not a burden. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's just a common uh, roadblock that many people who are helping to advocate come across when speaking to people. And um, and now to who Diana or, or um, any of the interns, you yourselves, if you could answer this question, what do you think is the piece of legislation or two pieces that you think will have the largest roadblocks and what do you think they are and what are our actual items uh, today to help you? For, for us, I think it's that people don't understand how important these issues really are for the young people in our schools. And so what we're going to be doing is gathering as many groups and names as possible to, to back these bills. So with the, the Maryland, I'm sorry, the um, menstrual equity bill, we really want to find students who are willing to share their stories in writing or even verbally, perhaps by video, because we're going to put together a composite video of people talking about why access to menstrual hygiene products is so important and we'll use that as a social media campaign and, and perhaps even part of our, our testimony that we wanna to present to our committees. 
But I also want to um, emphasize how important the situation is about parenting students. Because they haven't had access to childcare, like working parents have gotten some kind of federal relief by having vouchers have um, and be able to access child care during this pandemic, the parenting students have not. My concern is this is the school year that we're going to see a lot of these students never return because they are so far behind in their non-parenting peers. Had we passed this legislation last session, we would have had somebody in each school that would have reached out to these young people to find out how to secure that child care. So that way they're able to participate in remote learning just like their non-parenting peers. So we do have um, an email that we set up well, I have a story at prochoicemd.org. And so we're hoping that people will write to us and tell us about people they know or they themselves want to actually provide information and stories about why these bills are so important to them. And so that way we can gather these alliances for these bills. Thank you. Excellent. That is fantastic. I am a community health educator. Uh, for local hospital and one of the classes I teach is a stork's nest and work with a lot of different um, young people who don't know where to go and don't know what resources when they become pregnant. They ask me in the class and I uh, often don't have an answer for them, you know, about who they can call for childcare, who they can, you know, how they're going to navigate this. Do they have to go to another school? Can they stay at their school? Um, you know, then, then you get into the breastfeeding section. They're like, well, how am I going to do that? No. <laughs> So it's going to, I, I definitely um, applaud your piece of legislation. I look really look forward to getting those answers to be able to support those communities. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who was uh, presenting today. I hope I was able to um, get all of the answers to the questions that were shared with us. And I'd like to turn it back over to Ed and just say thank you so much for um, everybody's time. I look forward to working with you this upcoming session. Yes, thank you for all, all of the presentations today. They were great. Uh, this is now actually the conclusion of our week, week on, and long summit. And we're very happy with it. And we thank you all of you for coming out and doing presentations and listening and spending time. And we do plan on posting the videos and, the, and probably the chat somewhere we are still having discussions of some places where we can post them. Um, but we'll be posting and let you all know where that happens. So thank you for coming out. And that concludes the summit. Yay. Congratulations. Yay. Thank you. Wonderful program. Thank you very much. Thank you all.